Hello, and welcome to Juicy Scoop. I have a great show for you, as always. Lots of juicy topics, some updates on some previous juicy topics, and I interviewed Army Hammer's aunt, Casey Hammer, and you are going to die when you hear that interview. First, if you're watching this on um, YouTube, you're wondering, why am I dressed like that? Well, I'm Erica Jane, baby, because some big news has happened. That's right. Mr. Girardi, they have served him with eviction papers. The trust has taken over the $16.5 million home that I used to own. And uh, that motherfucker's got to get out in about 14 days. So as Heather McDonald, I asked my Juicy Scoopers. Um, well, I actually I didn't ask. I want to give, give Patty from Juicy Scoop Obsessed. It was her post. What will be Erica Jane's new tagline? And they were so good, I had too many to choose from. So here we go, as Erica Jane. People say I'm cold, but that's not diamonds, that's frozen assets. From rags to riches to now me digging ditches, I may be two people, and one of them is a crook. Pat the puss, but don't drop the soap. My son may be a cop, my ex a lawyer, but I'm above the law. I've always been a bitch, used to be rich, but nowadays, honey, I'm pleading the fifth. That one, I think, is really good. I used to please my man, but now I'm on OnlyFans. <laughs> I, I'll go from pretty mess to penniless. Like I said in season one, I'm a cunt. Zero cash, zero class, zero fucks to give. From a mansion to a condo, it's still expensive to be me. Wow. So there you go. Here's one of her posts, recent posts, um, during all this turmoil. Got buffoons eating my pussy while I watch cartoons. And then I noticed that Mrs. Jill Zarin liked it. It's always kind of surprising when you see who likes something. Jill, why, what do you know about buffoons eating your pussy? Moving on. Okay. I'm going to take this off, my wig, get back into my Heather mode. Wendy Williams, the Lifetime movie, was so freaking good, you guys. She also did a documentary, which is herself telling her story. And people are like, which one do I watch first? I would watch the Wendy Williams movie on Lifetime first. The girl that is playing Wendy has her voice down perfectly, looks like her, and it's just a fun to watch a Lifetime movie about someone's real life. Then the documentary is just freaking raw and um, still fascinating. But it's kind of cool to see the documentary after you saw it played out in an acted way in the movie. Um, I hope to, that I can do Wendy Williams' show again soon when it's safe and go to New York. Because I love doing her show. And she was an inspiration for this show. So watch it. It's just fascinating. And it's really raw and really brave. Okay, you guys, update on Jason Collier, who is the serial dater that just turned everything upside down. I talked about it last week. He has been arrested because he sent fraudulent um, annulment documents to one of his fiancés who didn't believe that he was actually divorced because he wasn't. He was married still to his second wife. So they turned those papers over. He was arrested Prior to that, though, the police department forced him to resign, which he accepted. And his wife, which we hadn't heard from in this last week, she, too, has filed from divorce. So if you see this cat crawling in um, your DMs or your Tinder or whatever, Jason41, beware. Because I'm sure he's not going to stop this. He's going to get a girlfriend in a couple months. He's you know out on bail. It was only a $10,000 bail. Um, he'll find some other job, some other woman, I'm sure. Um, but hopefully it'll be a little more difficult since um, since the work of all these women. Another update. Pamela Anderson, I talked about on the last show that she was married for the fifth time. And it sounded like it was all hunky-dory. They'd been together for a year. She said, we've been together for a year, but it's like seven years um, because we know each other so well. Well, his girlfriend of five years that whom he lived with 
brought his two children and her child, the five of them lived together as a family for five years, her helping to raise his two kids. She has a whole nother story. So he started working for Pam in fall of 2019 as a handyman bodyguard. Then he got more into fixing her um, place in Canada, in Ladysmith, Canada, is, or Ladysmith is her town or her estate. I don't know. But he would tell his wife what a nightmare Pamela was. She has text that says, oh, the dragon has been released. She's crazy. And then his, it's not his wife, but then his girlfriend would be like, oh, my God, just, Dan, just get out of there. It's a nightmare. He's like, well, she just married um, some guy, so our money problems are gone. That's when she married the producer for nine days, Peter, whatever his name is. And it's right here. This is his text to his living girlfriend. The living girlfriend writes him, oh, my God, Pamela Anderson just married a movie mogul, John Peters, just announced in 13 minutes. And the handyman, now Pamela's husband, writes to his then living girlfriend of five years, bah, he's older than her dad, but I think our money issues are over. Meanwhile, this woman's 21-year-old daughter is working for Pamela as well. So he starts staying there, spending the night because of COVID. So he's not coming home. Finally, the wife is like, what is going on? And he's like, I've crossed the line. He moved out of their home in July of 2020. And then they got married on Christmas Eve. And she didn't even know about it until the news came out. She just thought, yes, he was seeing her and they're separated. But they had she had no idea it was this um, intense. Nobody went to the wedding, according to her. Um, so when they say, oh, all of our family has appreciated it and uh, are obsessed with it and we're all so happy, nobody went to their wedding. So we'll see what happens with that. But he's 40 and she's 53. And the ex also says that Pam has bought him a boat, which she's crashed twice, and a car, which she's crashed three times. And they just sit on their porch and drink. And it's like the Dan and Pam reality show, which maybe they'll do a reality show. I don't know. But it wasn't the sweet story about a woman who finds the love of her life in her fifth marriage and her ninth wedding ceremony that I thought it was last week. So I like to give updates. The Bachelor, you guys, is amazing. So Matt did like a pretty woman kind of thing and took one of his dates shopping. And he goes, so one of my good friends, celebrity stylist, and it's this guy, just this like weird looking guy that looks like Millie Vanilli. And he puts Matt in this outfit that it looked like he had back surgery. It was like this big white cummerbund. It was so weird. Meanwhile, going along with also awful outfits, Victoria, Queen Victoria, the worst girl that's ever walked on the Bachelor um, franchise. She still only has that one bra that I featured in a couple episodes ago. Um, girls, if you're going to do the Bachelor you need a lot of outfits, but you also need some proper bras, maybe some cutlets, maybe some daisy um, stickies for your nips, um, a strapless bra, maybe an adjustable one. I don't know. Like, just not just the one white bra, as was seen on Victoria's horrible outfit. Well, he finally said to the one girl who talked like this, who was like, um, she's entertaining men for money. That girl, she got the boot because he's like... I don't care if this girl's a hooker light or what. It was mean, and I'm keeping this hot one. And the one with the weird face gets to go. Then he goes up to Victoria, and he's like, hey, I already let weird face girl go because she said that someone was a basically a hooker. But you also called a girl a hoe because she was a choreographer, and she was just crying. And I really don't like you. I've kept you for the last five weeks because the producers begged me to. So I think it's not going to work out. And she's like... Oh, my God. I'm like the hottest girl here. And it's really upsetting that someone would even believe that I would say that. It was a joke. I'm the nicest person here. Matt's going to be a loser. He is going to have no life. There's no good girls here. I was meant to marry him. He is pathetic. And I'm going to tell him. So then when she doesn't get her rose... And everybody gives him a hug and goes, so great to meet you. And everything, every time he goes, likewise, she comes up and she's like, um, I really think it's pathetic that you wouldn't take it from me and that you're just going to believe something on hearsay. And 
I don't even want to say good luck to you because you don't even deserve the luck. So she's gone. Wait for her podcast in a week. Okay. You guys, a lot of people wrote this to me. Um, yet again, another one of my predictions came true. Tasha from The Bachelorette, what did I say over and over? That she has gone to hosting school, that she knows how to hold her hands, and that she's going to be on E! or Entertainment Tonight. Yesterday, she posted, she posted, stepped into my dream job for a day, helping to host Entertainment Tonight. Um, and she posted a bunch of photos, one in which she's holding her hands like this. Also, by the way, Matt went to the same hosting school because every time he's waiting for the girls or walking up to Chris Harrison, he does this. Just puts his hands together. So there's a lot of hand training in hosting school. Um, so you guys, you guys were shook. A lot of you wrote me just going, here she is laughing. <laughs> a lot of you wrote me, Heather, how do you predict these things? How do they keep coming true? I'm terrified. Um, I'm scared as well. I do predict that I'm going to do a show in Houston, February 12th and 13th, and it's going to be sold out. And if you don't buy tickets, you're going to cry. Everything's at heathermcdonald.net. So I'll, when that prediction comes true, then we can talk about it as well. Anyway, I, I don't know what to say. I'm Tyler Henry. Um, there was an article because I talked about Bling Empire, another follow-up. How did this show come about? Turned out Kane, he was the one that had kind of the disturbing um, – cheek fillers that have since settled down thank goodness he and the pretty gir girl kelly who was in the abusive relationship with the white power ranger or no he is white and i think he was the orange or the red power ranger whatever he was an awful andrew boyfriend they pitched the show together so of course she got her her boyfriend to be on it because he's like i've been just wearing a power ranger outfit i'm finally going to get to be on tv as myself but she, he didn't realize that she was putting on him on the show so that the world could see what a dick he was and she could get out of this relationship. He's the worst boyfriend ever. I assume they're not together anymore. I don't know. A lot of you guys agreed with me. By the fifth or sixth episode, I kind of lost interest. I, I don't know how many episodes are left. I left around episode five. I don't know if I'll go back to it. I don't know if I'll finish it. I do enjoy the characters, but I don't know. It was fun for a minute. Okay. One more thing on Jen Shaw, the worst housewife ever. I got a tip. Now, this is allegedly from a girl in Salt Lake City. But she wrote me, I live in Salt Lake, and I know peeps who know Jen Shaw. She is awful. All of her assistants and bodyguards are her cousins. She has no business. It's all made up and fake. She sells COVID masks. That's it. She is awful. Now, this girl, I don't know if that's true, um, but... Uh, I, I would like to find out. So if anyone wants to do more research, if you are one of her former assistants that brushes her hair and feeds her oatmeal in the morning and you're like the fifth assistant out of nine, please let me know how you're all getting paid. This is this is different because Sonia would have the interns, which I don't legally think you can do anymore either, but I could see how she didn't have to pay those people. I just don't get that whole thing. So moving on with that. Um Marilyn Manson, the singer, the scary guy with the makeup, Evan Rachel Woods came out a while ago of revealing how abusive and horrible her relationship with was with him. Several, several other girls came out. Rachel Evan Woods posted all their DMs on her um, Instagram stories a couple days ago. And it's just very similar. Isolation, physical abuse, S&M. Um, verbal abuse, very strange. And then Jenna Jamison, who is like a big porn star who's now a mom and out of the business, she said that Marilyn Manson fantasized about burning her alive and liked to bite during sex when they dated. And she said once he kept saying, I can't wait to burn you alive, is when she said, you know what? I think there's other fish in the sea. So um, it just, it doesn't stop with this one. Now, that brings me to my guest, aunt of Army Hammer. Uh, this story is shocking, and I'm just going to go right with it. She's lovely and just, just it's so interesting, her background and her perspective on what's going on with her nephew now, Army Hammer. So here we go with Casey Hammer. 
So I am very excited, excited to, talk to talk to Casey, Casey Hammer, Hammer, who is the author of Surviving. What is the title of your movie? Surviving? Surviving, Surviving my, birthright. my Birthright. Surviving My Birthright, a book that I found out about from an Instagrammer and a TikToker named The Zen Blonde. So shout out to her um, for letting to make for making me aware of who you are. And then I reached out to you. Um, yeah, yeah. and I did the audio book over my, over the weekend mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you are the aunt to army hammer, the, the granddaughter, granddaughter to Armand hammer, who was, was a big, big shipping heir. And your story is incredible. And when I talked to you on the phone prior to this recording, I kind of said, said, what is, you know, what has the last week or two of your life been like? And, and why, why don't you, you just, just tell us? the listeners a little, little bit of how your life has changed in the last couple of weeks. Well, about, well, about um, um, two weeks, two weeks ago, ago, I was, I was contacted, contacted by a publication, by a publication. Um, when, Army when Army started, started blowing up, blowing on, the up internet. on the internet. And then, and then a week, a ago, week ago, Saturday, Saturday, Saturday I, woke I woke up a normal, up a normal life. life. And then all, then of, all of a sudden, sudden I was getting, I was getting text 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 saying, you're going you're viral on TikTok. And, and Twitter, Twitter and, and I am I am one hundred one hundred percent tech challenge, tech challenge social, social media challenge. Media challenge. So, so I was like, like I, I don't, don't need to know how to get on to get on kind of account because I didn't I didn't really, really do that much. much. I started, and I started looking, looking at the, at the um, tweet tweet and I was, and I was just blown away, blown away by, by this, this woman. I had actually actually had a TikTok, had a TikTok account, account because, because um, um, I wanted to I wanted watch. To watch. She, has she has 14 videos, videos on the on twisted, twisted something, something of Army Hammer. Hammer. But it was but really, it was really um, Heather all about um, Heather my all about book. Like, and she has the book she like in the background. Like in the background. I'm listening to her listening to her recount videos and talk videos. And I just thought I just thought oh shoot shoot my life my my life is not what I thought not, it was what I thought it was it's just different it's just and I different thought, my and brother's I thought gonna my me. brother's gonna kill me I couldn't believe I couldn't believe that she was saying I mean saying I mean it was all it was all out of my book so it wasn't like a like hidden 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 subject, subject matter, matter, matter yeah. all over the, the internet, internet. internet. And, and it, it was, was crazy. crazy. So, so I, I started, started a TikTok, TikTok page, page right? it had, it no, had content. no content. And Heather, and Heather that, day, that day, I had, I had 1,800 followers, and I had nothing, and I had nothing on, it. on it. And, and I, was I was calling my friend up in LA, and I was like, what do I do? Literally, I had no idea. And I'm watching the tweet tweet. On my, on my book, book. And, and currently, currently to date, to date I'm like 80,000 80, views, views of my of book, my book. And, it and it was just one of those moments where, where it just, it just was, it was bigger, than, bigger than, than, I, than I'd ever thought. thought. And, and, and you just, just kind of, it's not that you, you lose control, but you, control, control, but you just, just, just shake, just shake your, head. your head. And it's, and it's, I mean, I'm still, I mean, I'm still me, me, but it was just, just now, I'm now I'm all over the place in a way, in a way and, 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 and it's sad, sad by the way, by it, the way happened. it happened. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm, I, I, I feel bad, feel bad for Army. Army. Um, and, and again, again the, but it brought but it my book that I published six years ago, years ago and, then, and then just reading, reading comments. comments. Um, and um, seeing, and what seeing what people, people were, saying, were saying, it was really, it was really, really moving to me because, because that's basically, basically one, of one of the reasons I wrote the book, I wrote the book was, was, you know, to, you know, help, to people help people heal and empower, and empower, but, but yeah, yeah. Social, social media, media, I don't understand, I don't understand, understand it. it. I don't know. It's well, crazy. I, you know, I just really want to talk about your life because it is such an interesting <laughs> life. And there's a lot of questions I have that I okay, didn't okay. get from the book. Um, I definitely encourage everyone to read the book or listen to the book on audio, but let's just talk a little bit about, okay, the fact that your grandfather, Armin Hammer, who is the great grandfather to Army, correct, correct. he was, you know, one of the wealthiest people, right, in America. And so how did that translate to your life being the daughter of his son, Julian? Well, um, my, father, my father was, father was a child, child and, and so, so it... it it was, it was, it was crazy, it was crazy because, because, back, because then, back then it was a, it was very, a very tight, tight world, world that you grew, that you grew up, up in. My grandfather, my grandfather was known throughout, throughout the world, world and he was and very, he was very powerful. powerful. Um, um, and he, he, you know, he was, was, was close with Stalin, with Stalin and, 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 and all of those, those people, people um, that ran, that the, ran world. the world. And so it was very, very, um, um, it was, it was, I don't even, I don't know, even how know how to explain it. it. it, 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 it there's, there's, it was, it was just, just on the, on the outside, outside we had to be perfect. perfect. And on the, and on the inside, inside it, was, it was 
keeping, keeping these, these dark, dark secrets, secrets and twisted, twisted childhoods, childhoods and growing, and growing up that up way that was that um, way it was um it was different so so um so your mom married julian yeah. and they had you had an older sister what was her name yeah. again her name was jan and she was um my half sister and i didn't know she was adopted until i was um in my 20s actually and it came out so well you, um, you I say did... she's adopted but you then you said half sister so was she uh she was my child, mother's was child she... Oh, I see. And then you're then Julian married your mom and and Correct. adopted her as his own. Okay, got Correct. it. Correct. So she was a hammer, and so um, it was basically my sister, who's nine years older than I am, my brother, who's five years older, and myself. And, and that's basically and your brother. And your brother is Michael, and he Correct. is the father of Army Hammer, the actor Correct. who's now in all this turmoil of being um, sadomasochistic sexually and cannibalism. Correct. So. So you, where did you guys grow up? We grew up in um, Pacific Palisades. So okay. up in Los Angeles. Um, and I don't, um, my sister went to Marymount. I went to Marymount. My brother was shipped off to boarding school. Um, not a lot of memories of, of, of all of that. Um, it was, as I wrote in the book and talk about mm -hmm. how I grew up, it was mainly after my mom left my father and then, mm -hmm. Um, I was kind of shipped between places and experienced um, life with my father. And I talk a lot about that in the book, um, but it was, it was pretty horrific. Um, yeah. So, I mean, what I gathered is, uh, you know, they got, well, your, your father showed mental illness. He was in and out of mental correct. hospitals. Correct. Your mother was very much you know, that mom that's just protecting her cubs from getting yeah. hurt, from seeing violence, from, you know, she obviously was physically abused by your father when he had his alcoholic bouts. And finally, she divorces him, Correct. in which, you know, so shocking, she gets $200 a month in child support. Mm -hmm. Now, was that because of the times or was it because Julian, your father came from such a powerful family that by her leaving him, she was just like fucked. What was, well, what was that? My grandfather basically controlled the family, right? So it was okay. like, I always said it was like a chessboard and he made all the moves. And so um, his image was everything. I mean, the public persona of my grandfather around the world was, you know, perfection in a sense where he had this perfect family. So my mom threatening to leave my father several times um, was always told that she couldn't um, and she didn't have the courage to do so. And then I guess what ended up happening was I was a mistake. Whoops, sorry. I was a mistake and yeah. I was, um, yeah, the camera goes flying. Um, yeah. And so I was supposed to be a boy and I was told, you know, you were going to be called Casey regardless. And then I was blamed. My mom blamed me for having to stay with my father. So, you know, living with oh, that, really? yeah. yeah. And she had said that she could have left earlier if it wasn't for me. And, and so she waited till I was old enough, I guess, financially for her. And then my brother having the schooling. Um, so she basically stayed because of that reason. And then finally got to a point where she just left. Um, but she, you know, what I remember from my mom is this is hysterical, um, like her cigarettes, matched her outfits so I mean that was the kind of yeah and I always said you know my mom gave birth to me with a cigarette in one hand and a martini in the other so it was a lot of alcohol a lot of drugs um a lot of just partying and so my mom finally did have the courage to leave and she took me by that time my brother stayed with my father because he was old enough to take to make that choice um and he got disowned I think at one point from my grandfather so people always got disowned so you always had to walk that fine line. So it was, um, you know, you always had to be good. Uh, so you, did your did your father Julian? Did he even did he work or was he just living off no. like a trust fund or whatever? Well, my grandfather paid for everything. So um, you know, I always say there's a fine line between brilliancy and flipping out. Um, and my father was brilliant, um, but he always crossed the line. And I guess in his mind, he always said that he was the biggest failure of my grandfather. So he never felt, Heather, that he could fill the shoes. So he always tried to get negative publicity. So he was always, you know, screwing up and doing shit that made, you know, headlines and newspapers because it always would say Arm and Hammer's son, Julian, and 
you know, things like that. So he, um, that was the only way he could get attention. Um, so my grandfather paid for everything. He never, he never really worked. And where did your grandparents live when you were growing up and, and uh, their parents were still together? Well, they lived in Homby Hills. Um, oh, okay, in LA. Is, yeah, mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. And um, my real grandmother, um, I was told she was a Russian baroness and um, she was beautiful. And my grandfather brought her from Russia and they divorced um, right after I think my father was, I, I don't know how old he was, but I just remember being a little girl um, and I would go stay with grandma. So that was my real grandmother um, and she died of cancer. And so I that, think- So that grandmother was married to Armand. Yes. But they the divorced, they divorced. Yes. So you would visit her, but would you ever visit Armand as a All child? The time. Yeah, okay. we always had, you know, brunches, lunches, dinners, whatever on Sunday and you'd have to dress. And I would just always remember getting all dressed up and having Mary Janes and you couldn't get dirty. And you know, it was always, you sit around the table and you don't speak unless you were spoken to. And you know, you, you, you were served. It was, um, what's funny is I started watching Succession on mm -hmm. HBO, right? And yes, after I've like three, I had to shut it off because it was, it was triggering and giving me like yes. all these memories of what it was like. And so, yeah, that was like our family, but smaller version because it was only my father, my brother and myself usually that were at these lunches or, or dinners because my mom was kind of out of the picture at that point. But yeah, it was terrifying. It was horrible. Do you feel like when you, with your father having such a powerful, successful father himself, it's almost like there's just, especially during that time, it feels like, you know, maybe there was just nowhere, no place to go. Even if you had talents that you wanted to pursue, it's like they're never going to be good enough when your dad yeah. is this person. So then you Correct. end up just kind of giving up. And uh, unfortunately, he had quite a drug and alcohol problem too, your father. Yes, yes. And it's, um, you know, it was sad because at that point, I just felt bad for my father because it was pretty pathetic. I mean, he was very talented and very gifted and very smart, but he just, you could see he was just a shell of a human, right? And he had, you know, the drugs and the alcohol and it was just, it was, um, it was sad. And I think when my brother tried to destroy my father after my grandfather died, um, it, I didn't want that to happen. I mean, if my brother had his way, my father would have ended up, you know, homeless on the street based on how my brother controlled everything and the narrative on all of that. So it was one of those things where I, you know, not went to bat for my, well, I did. I went to bat for my father because I didn't want to see him. He didn't deserve it. You know, it was so, my grandfather. So how, so how old were you when your dad, um, you know, when, when Michael, your, your, brother who was only like five or how was how many years older than you who's five He's years five old. years older than that yeah. when he, when you say he started to try to take over and get in the graces of armin the grandfather and cut your dad out how old were you when the, all that started to happen that was i was in my late 20s so that was <laughs> when we were much older yeah um and i was in retail and I was working for a company in Hawaii, um, helping rent 40 stores. So I was kind of out of the picture because I never wanted to go work at Occidental Petroleum, my grandfather's company, because I wanted to go out and make my own name, right? And I mm -hmm. figured retail, he had nothing to do with. So that's how my journey on that end went, whereas my brother went to work for my grandfather. So my brother was in the inner circle um, and my father who was you know, nuts and not stable I just was, you know, living my life and, and working. And this all came as a surprise when my grandfather died and we found out that my brother, you know, had, had done what he did. And, and uh, you know, for and two explain, years- I, Explain what he did. Well, um, I guess for two, almost two years, um, Heather, my grandfather was slowly dying of cancer from what I understand, but they couldn't um, let the world know because the stock and things like that. So I would get calls every few months saying, Casey, you better come out here. You know, he's not doing well. So I would come and visit him. Um, and so these trips happened, you know, for about a year and a half. And then on the way to Europe for a, a work trip, um, I was told to come out um, and to visit my grandfather. And at that point, 
a lot of details were discussed um, about his will and about what was going to happen. Um, but what ended up happening was when my grandfather died and the reading of the will, my brother got control of everything, um, which was not supposed to happen. So, I mean, I explain it a lot more in the book, but again, it yeah. was um, basically when I was there in October visiting him, um, he was in and out of unconsciousness. I mean, he would say my name and then not recognize me. Um, and he was up in bedridden at the time. This was right before the Arm and Hammer Museum was going to open. So he okay. was very, very sick. Um, it was in 1990. Like, I think it was October. Mm -hmm. And so um, he had an attorney present in the room. And back then, Heather, you didn't write anything down or you didn't ask questions. You just, you know, yeah. your family said you were going to be taken care of for the rest of your life and you didn't have to ever worry about anything. That's what happened, right? So you never right. asked because then you know, you got in trouble. So anyways, um, he had said at that point that, you know, that he was going to put money in Swiss bank accounts for my father and myself, and that um, he would leave a little bit of money in the will just so it didn't look suspicious and not to worry, you know, and then, I, you know, all these kind of things were supposed to happen. Um, and it never, it never did. So what ended up when they read the will, my grandfather's best friend, who was his attorney, was supposed to be the executor and was always the executor. Um, had a falling out and Michael was then the executor. So during the reading of the will, um, my father and I are finding out that, you know, we were left little bits of money and uh, Michael basically controlled everything. So it was, um, it was one of those like right out of a Stephen King movie, you know, where he just kind of, the walls just kind of like start to wave and you, you're staring at paintings and you're thinking, pictures on the wall and you're like my what's going on like you think you want to wake up right like it's a nightmare it's an absolute nightmare um but then it, it was reality and um there was nothing we could do and at that time did you have a decent relationship with michael yes i thought i did but oh. the, the what came out um and my mom was still alive at this time what came out was that michael said that um he hated my father so much that he wanted to destroy him and i didn't want to let that happen because for one it wasn't michael's money it was my grandfather's money my grandfather had always taken care of my father so it was why would you throw him out on the street i mean my father didn't realize the gravity of the fact that there was nothing we didn't have anything, right? This, all the fortune went to Michael. So he had control of everything. So I was collateral damage is what my brother had said. So because I took my father's side, um, that's what happened. So we ended up um, taking action legally and fighting the estate um, a few years. And then after that, my father passed during the process um, but we were basically just, my brother said the Swiss bank accounts didn't exist. And the attorney that had been in the room said, you know, they're not there. I don't know what you're talking about. So all these things, Heather, were not in writing. Mm -hmm. um, and Michael had way more money than I did. And, um, you know, it, it was just, it was, I mean, I go into a lot of detail in the book. Right. Um, and so that's. And at that time, was Michael then married to his wife, who now I see they've divorced after like 32 years, but so they would have been married and, and I don't know when an army was born, but like prior to that, to this will stuff, were you like at their wedding and, and visiting them? Yes, I, I was actually in the wedding. Um, there was this um, relationship that came out that was, um, I was very close to my brother and um I had blocked out a lot of what happened in my childhood. So it was one of those things where um, it started coming out. Um, I had a moment that triggered um, the floodgates opening and I started remembering everything and confronted my brother on several occasions and he denied it. Um, and my half sister later confirmed a lot of what was happening to her, to me to my brother, to everyone. So it was one of those things where you're going along for 30 plus years, you know, thinking that you're close to your family, even though it's a really bizarre relationship and you don't really understand 
why you don't feel complete and why things aren't working properly in a sense of just relationships and just life and, and your kind of psyche and what you think about. Um, and so that was the challenge was now dealing with that and Michael also controlling my life in a sense of financially where I was going. Um, and it was a choice that you make where you think, do I sell myself out? Do I, you know, let go of my father's sanity and health and, and, and just, and I wouldn't do it. So yeah, it was, um, it was a come to Jesus moment, I guess. Um, and the fact that Michael and Drew were married and they had Army and Victor at that time. Um, and it was just, why are you doing this? You know, why? It just didn't make sense to me. And, and a lot of what's coming out now about my brother and what, how he's running the foundation and, and the art, all kinds of the museum. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. What was the latest mm -hmm. story that came out? Can you explain a little bit about the art? Um, I read part of it. Um, it was just about the, the forgery and, and um, we have hammer galleries or we had hammer galleries and Nodler galleries and we do have the Arm and Hammer Museum, which is in Westwood. Um, and I guess what was happening was there was um, some lawsuits against forged paintings and my brother, the way he was running the foundation. And I don't know all the details. I just know that there was a recent article. And when I read it, it was one of those moments where you're like, it's in print. You know, everything I've been saying all along about Michael is in print finally. I mean, yeah, it's one thing that I read a book, but it's another thing when people can read and see what he's doing. Um, and so when this all started happening with Army, it was one of those things where I, you know, I always said the acorn doesn't fall far, far from the tree. I mean, it was the environment that we grew up in. I mean, it was very violent and, and abusive and very toxic. So to see his behavior, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not surprised. Well, it's and interesting. I, some of the things that you did talk about your childhood um, in the book. And this is, you know, difficult to discuss, but besides your dad being drunk and violent, he played a game with these guests that were over when you were a little girl in which he got out his gun and he was like, hold up this yellow pages book, you know, which is a thick right. book. And I'm going to shoot at the book when you're right next to the book. And Michael was present for that. And these other people that are you druggy people that he picked up from Malibu and, you know, um, are hanging out. Sounds like a freaking Charles Manson evening is like what I'm imagining based on the era of time that that was. And um, just like violence and, and just terrifying stuff, which now when we know about Army's sexual deviant behavior, like the, de there is a weirdness of like the desire of seeing someone be afraid. And Correct. Getting, I mean, yeah, my, whole, my whole um, child. So what would happen, Heather is when my mom remarried um, and I was about 11 years old and she would send me down for the weekend with my father and my father wouldn't even know I was coming. My brother would pick me up um from the airport they were always you know parties and drinking and guns lots of guns and it wasn't you know just one gun and you were always being they were shooting at the walls and the police were always called and i just remember hiding in my room and just you know in the back of the closet just hoping for it to all stop and and it just wouldn't, and it would go for days and nights. And it was just horrific and terrifying because it's like, there were times where I would run out, my um, room had a sliding glass door and I would run out the sliding glass door and I would run down the hill and just want someone to take me and, and to save me. I mean, I remember one time in particular, you bring up Charles Manson. Well, this is exactly what this was. We were all out to dinner. And I remember coming back home with my father um, to his house and his girlfriend at the time. Um, and we just left my brother and his girlfriends. And anyways, we pull into the house and 
he opens up the garage and my father was always paranoid. So everything was always like airtight and locks and, and deadbolts and alarms and cameras and everything. And we pull into the garage and I just remember seeing everything in the middle of the garage, just like a tornado had come through. And my father got out of the car and went into the house and, and I walked up these stairs and I remember looking to the left and seeing his office and everything had been like knives, cut furniture, like they were looking for something and things that torn off the walls. And it just was frightening. And as I turned the corner and came around in, into the actual house, I'll never forget this. I mean, I still get nightmares about it. Um, a woman came around a bar and she was wearing a sheet um, and had a hat and like lipstick on the um, the sheet and eye holes and a butcher knife that was probably when you're a little kid, man, it looks like, you know, it's probably yeah. the size of a house, but you know, a, a giant, giant. Um, and she was carrying it and coming toward me. And I just remember looking around and, and seeing the writing on the walls and that, um, you know, like my grandfather, he almost tried to use blood or red lipstick or something. And it was things like fa fascist and pig and die and burn. And, and, you know, you're looking around at all this and, and you see the woman in the sheet coming at you. And I just remember turning around in slow motion, trying to get out of the front door and just being horrified and, and having her grab me and, it's one of those surreal moments where you're just like, you grew up really, really fast. And I remember going to the neighbors, I finally got away from her and I went next door to the neighbors and it turned into probably about a 24, 48 hour period where SWAT was called and, you know, helicopters and because they held my father at gunpoint and they wanted money and it was, you know, that was normal for me. So what's funny is- was, So wait, who was holding your father at gunpoint? These strange people that these, he had like- That started? were in the house, yeah. Because he oh. never believed, he never believed in banks. So he always kept cash in the house. So oh, like this, one time I had taken a, a, a bath in the sunken bathtub and I guess I overflowed it, right? And when I came back, he had like hundred dollar bills hanging to dry because what he did was he used to line the carpet underneath the carpet he'd put all his cash or in the heating ducts or you know in between like he would um, separate cardboard boxes and line it with with money so he had money everywhere and all his friends and and the drug people friends all knew it so they knew he had guns and cash so they came to rob him basically oh, I and see. we we came back early so that was um yeah so I don't at that point, um, I think after they held him for almost 40 hours, I'm not sure exactly the length of the time, but he finally said, you know, fuck it, I'm, excuse me, but I'm, uh, you know, walking out of the house and shoot me if you want. And at that point, he said he walked out of the house and everybody, because the SWAT people were all on the IV and all around, because it was Armand Hammer's son who was being held hostage. And so all these, you know, uh, gun cocks at the same time. And it was um, terrifying. But then afterwards, we went back in and Heather, I mean, I think I was 12, maybe 11, 12. And they said that I was a hero because I saved my father because I went and got help right next door. And I remember my mom seeing it on the news. She had just sent me down there for the weekend and seeing that, you know, we were held at gunpoint. So immediately I had to get back on the plane. Um, and yet I still wanted to go back down and visit my father because it was my father and it was you know, you look back on it and that's just what I was used to. Um, and so it was every time did I would go down allow, there, Did your mom allow you to continue your visits with him? She didn't want to, but um, she had to, I think, or my grandfather would have stopped the money or there was some kind of bargain or agreement. I'm not really sure how that all worked, but um, I just remember them telling me that like they couldn't take me out of the country without their permission or you know, my, like I said, my grandfather was very controlling and I was his only granddaughter. So, you know, in the public eye, you know, my father kept making front page news. Um, we had to behave. And when my grandfather summoned us to come, so every Christmas and Thanksgiving, it didn't matter where we were, we had, I had to be sent. Um, and then we would go to dinner and be with my grandfather for a few hours. And that's, and then we'd take a ride in his cars and yeah, it was kind of just, it, it was the afternoon and no one talked about any of this. I mean, no one 
ever talked about it. Um, you didn't talk about the violence. You didn't talk. So it was always suppressed. But I always remembered those memories. And I think the couple times I visited my father and the trauma of being shot at a lot. I mean, I was always, even as an adult, um, when my grandfather first died and um, I flew out and heard the will and came and mom, I just remember Ray Ronnie, who was the CEO of Occidental at the time, said, you know what, Casey, I'm going to pay you to come out here and stay with your father because we were all so terrified he was going to kill himself because he had no reason to live anymore, right? My grandfather was dead. So he was lost. I mean, literally lost. And so I came and I stayed with him. And I remember um, at that point, he was doing a methamphetamine addiction of like $10,000 a week or some random. And back then that was a lot. And I remember every hour he would come to me and make me open my eyes. And he had a 357 Magnum up to my temples. And he wanted to see if I was possessed by the alien. And I just remember, and I was 30 years old, Heather. It wasn't like I was a child anymore that I, and so it was like, you wonder why as an adult, I mean, I can't even explain that. It's like- why You mean, why Why did you continue to go back and, and be absolutely And, and stay abusive? with him, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then I remember my brother and his friends would come up to the house and, and they would laugh about it and they'd have their guns in their lap, you know, and waiting for my father to do something stupid and they were going to shoot him. I mean, they were always threatening to kill each other. It was just normal behavior. Like, like I'm going to shoot you and kill you. I mean, there's one incident too, I talk about in the book where, you know, there was a restaurant down in sunset and my father and brother, you know, got in a fight and the police were called and they went and got their guns and we're going to kill each other. And it's just when you have money, especially back then, nothing was ever questioned and so many things were allowed. I mean, when my father was flipping out, I remember the Beverly Hills Police Department kept bringing him back to me and saying, you know what, he's too smart to be, um, you know, admitted. Or, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yet he's too crazy it, it, not to be, but they would give him back to me because he was Armand Hammer's son and he just lost his father and how sad. And, and I would look at these people and say, I can't control him. I can't, you know, make him well. I mean, again, I don't know what possessed me to, to keep going back and to keep trying to make things right. But I think it's when you grow up in a, in a, in a abusive home and everything's a secret and, no one can talk about you think it's your fault i mean you think you're you it's it's you're the reason that no one loves you or that they're being mean to you or they're trying to hurt you or trying to you know kill you i mean you don't you didn't talk about it back then and even as an adult when i was writing this book long after my my father died um, my mother was still alive and and uh even then it was why are you doing this you know it was like it, it was just, it blows my mind. Um, and I think the one thing I wanted to do with the book is to be able to give people a voice to let them know they're being heard because Heather, especially children, when you think it's your fault, I mean, it's huge. It's, it's, it's you ju and you just keep going back because you want, you want to make it right. Right. You want to, you want love, you, you want to be a good girl. And I think that people just need to know that you know, they, they're heard and that they can talk about it. And then I guess it's creating a safe space for that to happen. And, and yeah, and you had mentioned too in the book, talked about a lot of it in the book, when you realized that you were sexually um, assaulted, molested by your dad and your brother, mm -hmm. you know, to give oral copulation to them. And, um, and you also said your, that your sister said this happened to her as well. Well, through, what, with, um, go ahead. what happened, no, well, what happened was, um, when this all got triggered, I was, uh, a friend of mine was a producer up in uh, LA filming a news station, um, promo and it was called victim no more ironically. Right. And so I was in, and I was trying to be an actor at the time. So I was in the, a garage and this person was supposed to come up and assault me and try and take my purse. So she's filming this. And when he goes to grab me, something snapped and I almost literally killed him. Um, 
and just tried to fight my way out of him. And, and Hickson was yelling, cut, cut. And I was just going like a wild animal, like get off of me and screaming for my dear life. And I remember shaking so much. And that's, that's when all these memories started coming back and I started remembering everything. And I remember um, saying to my sister, telling her, am I going crazy? I remember I couldn't, I, I could remember smells and, and tastes and, and um, senses and just so much detail, Heather, that I just, it, it was freaking me out. And that's when she said that my father was raping and abusing her and had threatened to come to me if she didn't continue. And remember, she's nine years older than I am. Right. Um, and that he was doing this to my brother as well. Um, so that when I was saying what my brother was doing to me, she was confirming everything that was happening. And at that point, I remember confronting my mother. I mean, remember, I'm mid thirties at this point, mm -hmm. confronting my mother, like, oh, she couldn't have known, right? She's my mm -hmm. mom. And she absolutely was in denial at first, but then she knew something was going on and she just didn't, her quote, I believe was, I didn't know it was that bad, right? Um, and the thing is too, with abuse, she was so angry at my father, um, hated my father for abusing my sister, hated my father for abusing my brother, but yet dismissed my brother from abusing me because it wasn't his fault. So Got you it. grow up, you're trying to, and even on her deathbed, all I wanted to hear from my mom was, I'm so sorry I wasn't there for you. And I believe you and I hear you, right? And, you know, she still, that was never said. So it's kind of ironic where you think, you know, you, you spend your whole life trying to get someone's love and approval and you make excuses for them. And you just kind of have to, to let it go and just take care of you because in the end, that's all that matters you know, taking care of you and healing um, and being okay with who you are and where you are. Um, because trying to control someone else's validation, it's not worth it in the end. You waste a lot of energy, but it was hard. It's still hard. I mean, I'm still healing from it because again, it's, it's especially your mom, you know, for her and, to. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, for her to acknowledge my sister's abuse, my brother's abuse, and she acknowledged my abuse. She just didn't hold my brother accountable. Right. Yes. And I, it, it, it's sad that, you know, yeah, it's sad that he was abused, but you know what? He did it to me and, and he needs to take, you know, be held accountable. So I always thought his boys, I mean, that kind of, environment that kind of you know childhood or or just culture or whatever however you want to say it when you're raised and that's all you know it's a learned behavior you know unless you absolutely separate yourself from the cycle and and acknowledge it and move on and heal and, and distance yourself from those people it's not going to change and you know money is a is a sick it it people used to say what was it like to be born in, you know, to that family and to have a famous family, because it was famous back then, um, you know, it just bought me better doctors. I mean, my problems are the same as yours. It doesn't, you know, I'm not going to discount your feelings because it wasn't on a grand scale like mine were. I mean, you know, it still hurts regardless of, you, no one should be abused. And, and, and so what do you, I mean, when you lost contact, you know, with Michael, because, you know, they, they right. cut you out. Right. At that time he was married, he had his kids, but they were young. I mean, right. you know, then I, I did a Wikipedia on them and I see, oh, he's got um, these Grace Christian Academy out of the Cayman Islands and the Christian radio out of the Cayman Islands. Right. I mean, that just looks real <laughs> shady. Well, I don't let know. Me, let me sum it all up for you. So yes. when Michael, who was a womanizer in college and slept with all my friends, I mean, did, you know, was just cheated on everybody, right? So that's his learned mm -hmm. behavior, right? He yeah. meets Drew um, and she's from Oral Roberts, Tulsa, Oklahoma oh, families. Okay. okay, so here's a good example. So when Army was born, my grandfather was very controlling both 
it was all about him. So his name was Armand Hammer. My father's name was Julian Armand Hammer. My brother's mm -hmm. name is Michael Armand Hammer. So my grandfather didn't want another Armand Hammer because he wanted to be the only Armand Hammer, right? So then Army is born, and I believe um, Alexander Armand Hammer was his name. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, Drew's parents come to the hospital and this is like the running joke because for Michael even to, to be interested in someone like Drew who was very religious right we all just laughed about it because it was like there was no way this was going to happen but anyways so Army's or Army was born I guess her father came into the hospital room and got down on his knees and spoke in tongues and God spoke to him and told him to change the baby's name to Armin Douglas Hammer. So they changed the birth certificate within 24 hours. I mean, this was also her father was the one at my grandfather's funeral that mm -hmm. spoke up and said that before Armin died, he accepted Christ. And the audience was filled with Jewish because my grandfather was a Russian Jew, supposedly. Right. Right. So all the Jews were in the audience. You had um, a famous <laughs> rabbi doing the funeral and then you also had Cardinal Mahoney there just for the heck of it right right but yeah but Drew's father standing up in front of all these people saying that he found Christ and my brother's face turned white because it's just like mortifying I mean how right you... so that's kind of the family um and what mm. I find so humorous when Drew left my brother um, mm -hmm. she called me now remember they hadn't spoken to me for quite a while but when yes. she left she wanted I guess me to verify how what a rotten person he was and how he stole all my money and all this other stuff when in actuality I wanted to remind her that it was her and him because she was mm -hmm. just as involved right so yeah. she you know a character witness but again, I was like, whatever I can do to help you, it's awful. Because I guess Michael had locked her out of all the accounts like within 24 hours. But the, the funny thing is, is that one of these new articles I read talks about, I think it was the one with the, the art, talks about how she opened um, a charity for abused women and children. And mm -hmm. I just started laughing because it's like she won't even talk to me. And she knew exactly what was happening in her life because she left my brother after my mother died to save face so for 30 plus years she had to have known what was going on because from what everyone says you know michael continued to cheat the whole time so she stayed for the money or the power or whatever um so yeah i just i always said that they were the born again fish people because they were the type that on their ferraris they had the fish right oh, oh um, like the genius yeah. fish <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't mean to offend anybody by that comment. No, but no, no. But funny, I right? Yeah. It was like yeah. you screw people all week, right? As you're driving your Maserati or your Ferrari <laughs> with the fish on it, and then you go tithe in Malibu, right? At that church where all the actors and movie stars go, and yes. you pay your pen, and then you continue each week to screw people, and yeah. So that's why I call them the born again fish people. I love but, it. Um, right. You know, what's interesting is so, you know, with this, with all these women coming forward, this one right. girl, Paige, came forward and I listened to an interview with her and um, she dated Army for, from like November, like October to like December of this past mm -hmm. year. And, um, you know, and, and right away it was very statist you know he shouldn't be on all fours she was walked around on a collar he carved his letter a in her body he wanted to take out her rib and smoke it and find a doctor and he said she goes first she thought he was joking and then she said who would do this and he goes oh i can find like a concierge doctor in la that will will take out the bottom ribs of your body that you don't really need and then i can and then I have a smoker. And she literally said he had a smoker outside that he wanted to smoke the ribs, eat the meat, smoke it. And, um, but she said that at one point he invited her to Thanksgiving and she went to Thanksgiving with his mom and there was a photo of it and everything. And she said, and that was like a beautiful, normal day. That was, they were, she felt like I, I have an adorable, smart, good looking, nice boyfriend. I'm meeting his mom. I have a normal life. Then the next, you know, then that night after the turkey dinner, she has to go be on all fours and say, yes, daddy, sir, and hit me more 
And then all of a sudden she finally kind of woke up and was like, even though I've consented to this, um, I don't want this anymore. And she just, right. you know, pretty much ended it over text with him. And, you know, and of course there's a, a ton of other girls because right. you're smart, you're good looking, you're rich. And these girls think they're cool and they can handle this kind of relationship and how, why, I'm not going to say no to this, you know, I mean, right. he has everything going for him and now this is being revealed and um and then to match it up with your history of a family it's just it's really fascinating and it all makes sense and when i asked you i said are you you said well i'm not surprised to hear about it i'm not yeah. surprised to see that he's in this position now do you no, want to speak a little on that well it it's it's really sad but that's kind of how we grew up perfect on the outside and twisted on the inside. You know, it's, it's, um, again, when, when the, the, the allegations and articles and everything started blowing up, it was, um, a moment of, you know, these women, it's really unfortunate because no one should be treated like that and people stay. And until you understand being abused you don't understand that behavior why are they saying why are they but something from their past and i think that once you know i wrote the the book and people said to me especially lately with a lot of the comments about how you know i read your book and it triggered something or i'm, I'm i you know read it with my mom and and it she was abused and this helped her heal because again when you hear other stories you don't have to put up with anything and you know these women you know you read that it may have been consensual and stuff but that doesn't mean they consented to dark twisty you know right. down the rabbit hole kind of behavior and it's almost like i believe that you know like you said the the outside looks fabulous you know you you've got everything but again you've got to almost sell your soul like i always uh, say that my brother is the spawn of Satan, you know, because it's, he's all the darkness and the bad hammer genes mixed into one and that no one could be that, that evil and sociopathic. Like you can't, how can you look in the mirror and, and be okay with what you're doing? I mean, and have no conscience, right? Or humanity or compassion. And yet Army and, and his brother, Victor, were raised in that environment. And I don't care if it's in the Cayman Islands or in Los Angeles or where it is. It's It bleeds into, I mean, my brother just didn't change overnight, right? He didn't right. flip the switch. So again, it's like, it just was a matter. It's unfortunate because Army's, what, 34, young, had the world at his, at his fingertips. I mean, he really was trying on the outside, okay, I don't know about the inside, but even um, at my father's funeral, for example, my brother shows up with Army as a, I think he was, he was pretty young. Um, I don't even think he was in his teens, but they show up to the funeral. Now this is after my brother has taken everything from me and not given me anything. And I'm at the funeral um, and my step monster, my father's wife at the time invites my brother an army up to the house and I couldn't understand why she was even doing that after everything he did anyways because my father had died in the middle of the lawsuit right so my brother comes up and and even Heather as he's standing there and he's like how are you and I'm like I'm all right and I said you know Michael I love you and I hugged him mm -hmm. and yet you know you you don't even understand why you do that but it's it's kind of like getting beat up beat up beat up beat up and people right. go back and back until you get help and tell you have mm -hmm. someone that can then help you you just do these kind of things and you can't explain it so again with these women i mean people are so quick to to troll and and say negative things and judge them and and but again they didn't necessarily sign up. Maybe they, they went into it. I, I have no idea. I can't even, I can't even speak about why they went into it, but no one deserves to, to be pressured into that because again, you get into something and it's hard to say no, because you have someone saying, why not? Everyone else does, or, you yeah. know, from what, from what I'm understanding. He, you know, um, and now they're seeing, they're seeing like little signs of things that he had done in the past. Mm -hmm. Like, 
um one of the things the girls said is like from the very first moment they got together he was like into her feet like kinky feet stuff and then there was an instagram post or something that he or his wife i think he had posted it since been removed when they were still together army and his son grabbed his toe and was like putting his toe in his mouth and you know they kind of were like haha that's a little bit weird and they posted yeah. it and now of course it's been removed but everybody's like a couple people were like you know i saw that a year ago and i thought there was something creepy about it right. and right. you just you know who knows what their childhood was like army and victor who knows I what can... they were exposed to i mean right. And you, you can only speculate too, you know, like, um, but it obviously the puzzle pieces are making a lot more sense now, yeah. having yeah. talked to you, having read your book, having more and more come out. Um, you know, he has a movie coming out that I saw a trailer to called Crisis, mm -hmm. Army does, and it looks excellent. It looks right. excellent. Right. And I'm like, you know, I want, I'm going to see that movie. I don't know that he'll ever get any movie parts after that. This has already been filmed. I don't know how much they're, I don't know if it'll get to a point where they try to replace them like they did with um, Kevin Spacey in the mm -hmm. um, Getty movie um, right. because he the, the, the preview is out. So I don't know what they're gonna do. Um, but the movie looks like something everybody would be interested in seeing, a big blockbuster right. thriller. Um, of course he had to step down from the J-Lo romantic comedy. Right. Um, it'll just be interesting to see you know, will he continue to work or will he go away? I mean, do you have any well, prediction? Well, well, the interesting thing was that trailer came out, I guess, recently um, for that new movie and Evangeline Lilly and is it William Defoe? I think there's three of them in the poster um, and they were saying she shaded and said something about she was honored to be in the picture with just him, not Army. She didn't mention Army at all. So oh. that was recent. Um, you know, again, it's, it's, what I find fascinating um, is no one's come forward for him. I mean, mm -hmm. my brother hasn't spoken. His mom hasn't spoken. No friends have spoken up. No, um, you know, people that he's been in movies with. I mean, it's just been radio silent. And I, mm -hmm. it's almost like the calm before the storm. And I have a feeling there's a lot more that's going to be unveiled because, um, I just think it's gone down the rabbit hole and it's just really dark and twisty. Um, and again, I know these are only allegations and, and I wasn't there and I don't know what really happened. I just can only speak from my experience with this family. Um, and it's, it's pretty bad. It's, it's really bad. So um, the fact that I don't know what's gonna happen to him. Um, yeah. I feel bad for his children. I mean, mm -hmm. I just feel bad for the situation. Um, but again, it just shows you, I mean, my brother, he's controlling the narrative. I don't know if, I don't know. I don't know why he's not speaking up or someone mm -hmm. speaks up. It's public. I, I mean, they've all just kind of Because quiet. it's kind of indefensible. So I think they don't even want to say anything. You know, they want right. to hope that some other scandal happens and takes its place. You right. know, exactly, exactly. Um, and that's, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. I mean, you know, for me, um, I, I wish him well. I mean, again, I haven't spoken to Army in almost 13 years once my mom died. Mm -hmm. um, what was interesting was we, when she died, we had, um, we spent a week with my mom, um, my brother and his family, um, and my sister and her family, um, and myself. And we spent a week in the room um, trying to get along for her sake. And then, you know, she died. And then all of a sudden, my brother's just like, I was, because that was right before Army and Elizabeth's uh, wedding mm -hmm. in um, May. And I was invited. I was going with my mom and everything was going to be fine. I mean, we all had a relationship. You know, it mm -hmm. wasn't, it wasn't even after, you know, the, the lawsuit with the estate. It, it, we still, you know, for my mom's sake, we would get together or speak or talk about each other or whatever. But anyways, we spent the week together. Um, and then right after she died, um, I was uninvited to the wedding. Oh, um, really? They wanted nothing to do with me. Um, and yet in front of my mom, they had promised, oh, you know, everything's fine. You know, we'll embrace Casey, all of that. And 
Uh, and then at that point too, my sister um, ended up going with my brother in a sense. And I just, yeah, so they just are. Oh, so you don't talk there. to your sister now? No, she, um, when my mom passed, um, she was, I don't know if, I, I know that my brother gave her a car and some other things, and I'm not sure how that all translated, but, you know, again, money buys loyalty. Yeah, on silence. So, exactly. Money buys silence. Exactly. Ka Casey, this is so interesting, and, and Elizabeth actually just broke her silence on her Instagram, Army's ex-wife. And she just said, like, I'm shocked. I have no words. Um, I'm here, for, you know, I'm just gonna focus on my kids and, you know, learn more about this. But I mean, what a weird position she's in. Who knows, is it possible that he had like a completely different sex life with her? And then all his extracurricular sex life was this crazy shit? It's possible. And the reason I say that, Heather, is because I think that's how my brother was with Drew. Um, oh, okay. You know, she she knew what a lot was happening because she told me that after she had left him, she knew he was cheating on her. So I don't know if she had her two boys and was just living the dream um, and letting Michael do his extracurricular activities mm -hmm. and then so I'm sure people think that kids don't understand or, or don't know, but they see everything. So it could have been a learned behavior. And if that's yeah. all Army knew growing up, then absolutely that could have been possible. I mean, that's, I'd only- that, That's really interesting because I just saw the Tiger Woods documentary and Tiger who spent so much time with his father in that documentary, it was revealed that his father was a serial cheater and these girls would come to the golf course and Tiger was eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, oh and would see the women meeting his dad and knew it, never talked about it, never said it, but knew that his mom was at home being cheated on. And then of course he went on to, you know, have 15 girlfriends or whatever it was. So it is really, this is just all so fascinating. Um, Casey, That's thank crazy. you so I much. That. Yeah, that just came out too. And right. I thought that, and that was the first time that was revealed really mm -hmm. is in this mm -hmm. um, documentary. And, um, but Casey, tell everybody where they can get your book and um, oh, follow yeah. you now. And, um, you know, we'll just be in touch as this more unravels. It's um, so on Instagram, it's Casey Hammer 21. And then I have a TikTok page. I still don't have, con but I have, yeah. So I'm learning, I'm tech challenged. So again, give me give me time, but you can find my book on amazon.com. And um, again, it's called Surviving My Birthright. And hopefully I'll be writing the sequel here. It's right here. <laughs> yes, yes. We um, definitely want to hear the sequel and kind of putting all these pieces together. The second part of your life post this uh, scandal, I think would be really interesting. Yeah, and I just want to do a shout out to the Zen Blonde because again, I a week and a half ago, I woke up a, a still a normal person working at Home Depot as a kitchen designer. Um, and now it's like, it's crazy. It's, um, it's crazy. But again, if, if helping, you know, tell my story helps other people heal, that's, it makes it all worth it for me. So yes. um, again, I just, I appreciate you, Heather. Um, and thank you for finding me and being you because, you know, it was just, I remember when I first talked to you because I, everyone was like, be careful, be careful. I was like, no, 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 she has the best energy and it feels like a safe space. So thank you for, for at least letting me have this um, chance to talk to you and kind yeah, of share I my story. It. Thank you.